What's up y'all, welcome back. This is just a reminder that while we might get into some tea, some drama, this is not a tea channel. We're focused on real stories and real commentary. Now, let's get into this video. So we left off on episode one stating that Jocelyn abruptly quit loving hip hop Atlanta after six seasons on the show following beef with the show's creator Mona Scott Young and she decided to venture onto other things. She finally broke free of Stevie J as much as she could, made more music and began making relationships with other media networks, most notably WeTV. Not even a year after quitting Love & Hip Hop, Jocelyn had already signed off to begin production for her very own reality docuseries titled Jocelyn Takes Miami with WeTV, as well as a couple other TV appearances with the network. However, come 2019, WeTV decided to halt the production of Jocelyn Takes Miami for undisclosed reasons, requesting Jocelyn's production to reshoot certain aspects of the show. Later that year, Jocelyn was approached by Zeus Network to sign a deal producing her own projects and of course she accepted. Now the difference between Zeus Network and WeTV is that what can't be shown via WeTV will, without much doubt, be aired on Zeus Network. Around this time, Jocelyn also temporarily made amends with the producers of Love & Hip Hop and she agreed to join the cast of Love & Hip Hop Miami, as well as she did a season of Marriage Boot Camp on WeTV. This meant that on top of daytime TV appearances and major interviews, Jocelyn was set to do what was probably her biggest year on TV across three different shows and two networks. Jocelyn Takes Miami was repurposed as Jocelyn's Cabaret and carried by both WeTV and Zeus Network initially. This was Jocelyn's dream to open up her own cabaret and give women similar to young Jocelyn an opportunity to change their life, a way to uplift and empower women and give them a chance to make their way off the streets and out of raunchy clubs into a more classy environment where they can decide how much skin they wanted to show and instead of twerking off the walls, they could be a part of an actual show and be a cabaret girl. Sure, Jan. Remember when I showed this photo when talking about Shanelica Gate? This is a still image taken from a pilot reality show that Jocelyn was set to be a part of back in 2007. Jocelyn danced at a club in Miami, and can you guess what it was called? Diamonds Cabaret. And the club was set to have its own reality show about the dancers. Does that sound familiar? Season 1 of Jocelyn's Cabaret aired in 2020 and was heavily critiqued as it honestly wasn't perceived to be that great. And I'll be honest, I didn't watch season 1. From what I did see, it wasn't much different than season 2 and season 3. But season 2 is what really put Jocelyn's Cabaret on the map with a scene that will go down in reality TV history. Yeah, double homicide. And perhaps Jocelyn's most viral catchy song. Season 2 was the best season of this show. There was a proper introduction. We got to know a little about each of the girls. We had kumbaya moments, counseling, viral moments, shade, real story progression, a dance-off, and there was a motive for each girl to not only make it into the cabaret, but to also win $10,000. And what surprised me is, Jocelyn seemed to be just being Jocelyn. Yes, she was a little unnecessary here and there, but this was my first time seeing Jocelyn in a softer energy on a TV show. Not soft. Who you calling that? Just softer. Who you calling that? And I felt like this was more of who Jocelyn was on a regular basis when she's not having to constantly argue with or about her man. And I really wish I could say the same for season three. Let's just keep it real. Season three was a hot burning mess. From day one, it was the unsettling calling of Jesus, the disrespect of the lighting in the confessionals, Paris, London, Tokyo, American Idol, military lineups, body slams, big booties, little booties, pop walking, dropping, and all of this in the first two or three episodes. And I don't even know where to start. But what I do know is, this Jocelyn was not the same Jocelyn I experienced on season two. 
This Jocelyn was not the same Jocelyn Stevie said had grown and matured since having Bonnie Bella. This is not the same Jocelyn who was in those interviews advocating for women empowerment. This Jocelyn was more of a madame instead of a mentor. She was a bully and what many people think of as a pimp. And I ran my own organization, but I but I've had a lot of girls work up under me before mm -hmm. I had the cabaret. You, I kind of taught them the same thing that I'm teaching the girls now at the cabaret. Mm -hmm. They're calling me a p since I've got the cabaret. <laughs> okay, they're like Jocelyn, is you? P and I'm like, no, I'm helping. You know, so I think that Spoken we like a pimp, Jocelyn. Yeah, that is that is weird. <laughs> my theory is Jocelyn is a person who confuses fear with respect. And on season two and possibly season one, many of these women were self-starting with their own mind and talked to Jocelyn as another grown woman rather than their master. But it's possible that after watching some of the episodes in the social media aftermath, Jocelyn felt as if she allowed the ladies to push her around, thus coming to seek vengeance on the reunion and redeeming herself immediately on season three. But many viewers did not feel any sympathy for the women of season three as they felt like by now they should know what they're getting into. And I agree, but to an extent. Jocelyn really wasn't this harsh on season two, but I get it. This is Jocelyn after all. Then it was speculated that the cast signed a contract that prevented them from touching Jocelyn, but that was denied by many of the girls. So I'm thinking to myself, if there's no contract, why in the world would they allow her to talk to them and to treat them in the way that she did? And then it dawned on me, this shit is fake. We can't allow no slander to Jocelyn, though. We, that's what we can't do. So it's how she close to y'all. Because at the end of the day, if she's here to give y'all an opportunity and she wants y'all to respect her, it's, it's a back and forth respecting. Y'all never had a boss or a manager or whatever that talk crazy? Like, for real? Like, it's not that deep. Or even uh, and it's for TV, so you got to understand when someone is treating you good, when the camera's not rolling and everything is good and she's taking care of you, getting giving you money to take care of you know, honestly, like taking care of you off camera, everything's good. So it's just like, it's different. You know, it's just, that's what everybody just needs to appreciate. Good entertainment. No matter how, how wild it may seem. kind of scripted everybody to fight. Like they wanted to, you know, just get, re like get views, really. I was just like, this is too Hollywood. If people want to fight, they're going to fight naturally. So she done told you to fight that girl. <laughs> if Joseph did not fucking tell me to fight that girl, I would have never laid my mother hands on that girl i knew it was fake i'm not only acting in the show i'm producing i'm writing storylines i'm you know i'm teaching the girls how to be the best reality superstars they could be by giving them direction on how to do it using their own personalities their own way of being i knew it now don't get me wrong all of it isn't fake but the ladies weren't really coming at jocelyn because they had an understanding that on camera jocelyn and off camera jocelyn would be two different people and even if certain reactions to some situations were real some of the situations itself was a setup. This would explain why Lollipop allowed Jocelyn to try to force her to say that she's not as pretty as Beyonce, even though Lollipop obviously isn't the type of person to allow someone to talk to her like that. And this is where I have to hold the cast accountable because even if you didn't know exactly how you would be edited on the show, if a person is acting one way on camera and one way off the camera, you should have some kind of idea. So as grown women, in a way, they agreed that being humiliated on camera was worth being on the show, being on the cabaret, taking this opportunity, and being Jocelyn's friend behind the scenes. But regardless of what parts of the show were real and what parts were fake, treating these women like this just was unethical and hypocritical to whatever empowerment Jocelyn claimed to be trying to instill in these women. Actually, Jocelyn had been hypocritical from the very beginning. How you gonna call K Capri manly looking EJ Johnson when you had to post nude photos on the internet just to prove that you're a woman 10 years ago? How you gonna allow one of your contestants to be talked about for an abortion when you had got pregnant by a man you hadn't known for more than a year and had your abortion? process aired on national tv and most of all how could you sit back and allow a white woman and a non-black latina freely use the n-word in the same year time span that you as a black puerto rican woman called yourself standing up for women specifically black women on the wendy williams show 
Latinas and black women sit on her couch. She's always going for annihilation, an like, but you don't give me my props. I'm trying to make it all make sense, but it's really just making my head hurt. Something else I found atrocious was how two cast members were bullied for absolutely no good reason. And I get it, one was annoying because she didn't take up for herself and was perceived to be a little flip floppy. And the other one was annoying because <laughs> But is that a reason to start an unprovoked fight? Wet Wet is a mom of two, which one of her kids has special needs that she has to tend to on the regular. Prior to the show, Wet had been homeless for two years and had just recently found a home, albeit public housing, but still a home. Previously during the pandemic, she was able to score big by investing in Dogecoin, which provided her the money she needed to pay for Paris and London, something she had been wanting for years. So now knowing that, it makes a lot of sense as to why she won't shut the hell up about those twins she got sitting on her chest and why she's so excited and loud about them as well as just being on TV, being a part of a show, meeting Jocelyn, getting to stay in the house, getting to possibly be a part of the cabaret even though she knew she couldn't dance. This was just like a one in a lifetime type of opportunity for Wet Wet. But from the moment she appeared, she was immediately picked on. She's one of the smallest girls in the house, and she was thought to have been an easy target, but she was actually the most mature cast member on the show. Even after Amber, allegedly, beat her up, Wet Wet still sat on the sidelines clapping and congratulating Amber on making it into the cabaret. But then she, allegedly, got beat up again for not being a hater. And because the losing girls just hated their current life at the time, let's just run up on Wet Wet. If we're talking women empowerment, if we're talking uplifting women, how is putting hands on a girl who's just happy to be there or a girl who's congratulating someone else meeting that criteria? Stop letting bullying take place on your show. But the thing about it is, she's not going to do that because production is the one telling Kay Capri and telling Amber to pick on Wet Wet. Now, Chanel's situation was totally different, and this was probably the most misunderstood and manipulated storyline of the series, the story of Chanel self. I believe most of the cast members are misunderstood to a certain degree, but no other castmate was mishandled like Chanel self. Chanel entered the cabaret on season two, and what a lot of people don't know about Chanel is that she is a self-proclaimed hippie. And this was a critical part in understanding Chanel's character. Now in the beginning, Chanel was a little back and forth. Seemed like she was trying to figure out how she was going to go about being on the show. And when it came to Blueface Barbie versus Lucky, she was being a little messy. She quickly settled in to just being Chanel and was ultimately the underdog who ended up not only securing a spot in the cabaret, but winning the grand prize of $10,000 and being guaranteed a spot on the Vegas cabaret. In Jocelyn's speech of announcing Chanel as the winner, she didn't hold back from speaking ill on Chanel's body. Yeah. She, she was a quiet little mouse and a follower. She had a big belly when she came to me and she was a drunk. Through sisterhood, through therapy, through, she practiced daily and she let, and she was the underdog. And everybody thought she was just a big belly drunk bitch. She gave her a chance. But when Ashley brought it to my attention two days ago, Ashley said to me, did you look at Chanel? I said, hell no, I ain't look at that hoe. And you know what Ashley called me? You need to look at her. And I've been looking at you for the past three days. And you are so worth the $10,000. Granted, working in this field, you do have to keep your body up to par, but Jocelyn, you already told Chanel and the viewers and all the other girls that you didn't like Chanel's stomach. So why did that have to be announced during her winning moment? Notice the show did not have a solo winner on season one or three, so Chanel is the only girl to win a grand prize on the cabaret across all three seasons and this is how Jocelyn chose to present it. Both Chanel and Lexi Blow were called to come back for season three 
and little did they know they were being set up. Jocelyn and production made it seem as if these two were coming back to manage, to help, and to be Jocelyn's left and right side, especially Chanel who had already won the cabaret and was promised a secured spot on the season. But did the rest of the cast even catch that memo or did they just not care? First time viewers and the new cast were under the impression that Chanel and Lexi Blow were friends and when Chanel refused to comment on whether or not Lexi was talking mess about the new girls, it made it seem as if Chanel threw Lexi under the bus. And that's what I thought too, until I did some further investigation and I saw that maybe it wasn't just that Chanel threw her under the bus, maybe Chanel peeped that Lexi Blow was an undercover hater. <laughs> Unfortunately, this video has already surpassed its time limit, so I'm going to have to break up episode two and a half. But good news, the next part of this episode will be ready in about one or two days. So stay tuned to The Real on Reality TV because I still got to prove my case about Lexi Blow and Chanel. We haven't even touched on Amber and Kay Capri, Ballistic, the $25 million lawsuit, and I have a few more points I need to make about Jocelyn herself. Thank y'all for watching and keeping up with this series. I'll see y'all in episode 2.5. <laughs>